uh, uh, transferred to become a secretary for education, additional secretary, to deal with IITs, for example. This man, IIT, he doesn't know what, anything about technical education. He doesn't know anything about engineering. He doesn't know anything about science. But he runs IITs. So this is the kind of thing. So we have to be very sure the kind of administrators who administer education in central government and state government. State governments are much worse. Well, I think this is a very big limitation for education. You, want, you need approvals. You need all kinds of things from government particularly government institutions, they are the biggest bottleneck for progress. In fact, the other day I was in a meeting, the finance minister was telling me, in that, this, the previous finance minister, doesn't matter, in a meeting, he was saying, we make all kinds of declarations in the parliament, in committees, but actually many of them don't get done because the bureaucrats don't let them happen. They decide what really happens in India. What really happens eventually is decided by our babus, and babus are unfit to run education. I think we have to do something. If you want to liberate education in India and make it a free enterprise, I think, and exciting enterprise, government bureaucracy, bureaucratic control must be removed as much as possible. The way they give money, the way they control money, in fact, many institutions cannot spend money they get because there's so many controls on how to spend it. And so the auditing and accounting procedures of our country are the same for education, you are a university or a research laboratory, the same procedures employed as for a district office or a revenue office or something. They're all the same. Procedures are the same. Promotion schemes are the same. Everything is similar. So education can't. <laughs> the reason we have a Harvard or a Stanford or a Berkeley or a Cambridge or an Oxford, of which at least three of those universities I belong to somewhere or the other, is not because of the accounting procedures and bureaucracy. It is because of the freedom they have enjoyed. You know, that freedom for running education institution, and therefore limitation of bureaucracy or minimizing bureaucracy, I think is extremely important. I think IAS is a good thing to have maybe for other things. We have to see whether it is the best way to run Indian ed education administration. Lastly, I already mentioned in my uh, award acceptance speech about the teacher. I'm sure all of you being interested in education have seen the best science education, where is it being given? You have seen the ordering of countries. I hope you have seen that report that came a year or two years ago. The best science education is not in the United States. It is in Finland. Finland gets the number one ranking because of the respect for the teaching profession, where teaching profession is made so important that everyone wants to become a teacher instead of becoming an AAS. So that is what we want in India, where teaching profession is respected sufficiently, rewarded sufficiently, that the best of our minds also become teachers. Well, here I want to say something about teaching. You know, I've taught a lot. I enjoy teaching my undergraduates. I mean, some of my students are even here. I found uh, those of my I've, I've taught in IITs and so on. But I tell you, even now I teach a lot of undergraduates in various places. I, just now I'm rushing from here to give a lecture at St. Stephen's College, actually, to, uh, this afternoon on chemistry. Well, the reason I'm mentioning teaching is IT and all, you know, I'm, I'm not a great champion of IT. I, it's all right to have it. Like mobile phone, it's nice to have it. But mobile phone has also destroyed man. There are people are always busy holding something here. They, don't, they have no mind, they have no time to do anything. What are they so busy talking about, all people in this world? What are they, Bridget? What is it they're talking? I don't know. How come they didn't talk all this before? How come suddenly they're finding it so much to talk about? And you know, my secretary, when I go there, she's having this. And I can see my student here. In fact, the slowly Darwinian evolution I believe in, the children will be born in about few, another few thousand years with one hand. <laughs> because, uh, because the children will have this mobile, you see, stuck already. I think this is the reason I'm, I'm, I'm joking about it because I'm not against anything. We have to know how much to use, how much not to use. IT is all right. If IT was going to the bull revolution, that has closed down all the colleges then. No, no. I tell you, eventually, the only time people get excited in science or any subject is because of the direct contact with the teacher. Don't ever remove a teacher. And America has learned to that now. America has, you know, I belong to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences as a member for many, many years. One of the major programs we have in the U.S. National Academy of Sciences is how to improve science education at schools in America. It is in a very bad shape. 
If America is not succeeding, you can see it's not because of IT or mobile phones. They have enough of that. The absence of a teacher for direct contact, the right type of teaching, the right excitement. You know, people get inspired when you give a good, proper lecture. That they will never forget. In my own life, I can tell you, one incident in 1945 when I was a high school student, I was exactly 11 years old. I started high school at the age of 10. I was very lucky those days, there was no age limit uh, for any education. And then C.V. Raman came to our school and gave a wonderful lecture on what is to do science and physics. I'll never forget that. I'm 11 years old. Then, I, then he asked our teacher, why don't you bring two or three of your good students to, to my lab? I want, I'll take them around. Next week I went, and there was C.V. Raman showing around for one hour through his lab, 1945. Of course, later I got to know him very well. He was very good to me. I worked with him in various ways. But what I will never forget is that one inspiring moment where this great man directly talked to us. I think, let us not forget, therefore, indirect or direct excitement and inspiration you get from contact, teacher. So, just because we have IT, virtual universities, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all that is okay, but none of the great things will come out of them. No great things will come out of them. You can have them all, have it all. <laughs> I, I won't send my children there, but I, I'm too old to have children now, but I'm saying next birth, I won't send them. Uh, connectivity is a very big thing in India. I don't mean connectivity of people, I think, I don't mean. You see, for example, international collaboration, working with the best of institutions, internal connectivity, as one of our speakers said in the morning, I think should be have no barriers. Connectivity should be a natural thing in education. And we must do everything possible in this country so that it becomes natural, barrierless in the years to come. The, the people, people have to think about how to do that. I'll come to the last, uh, almost the last point of my, these are the 10 points, the essential steps for future education I'm talking about. There are many small things, I'm not going to mention that. The last is creativity. I feel the children are okay up to high school in India, even today. It is slowly they get destroyed. Their minds get destroyed after that. Innovation, creativity, and these things, if you want to promote them, there is no formal way of doing it. Well, I'm just reading a report. One of my friends is involved in it in Britain. The Britain is terribly worried about the absence of creativity in children. They say creativity and innovation uh, has come down in uh, Britain. That is what they are saying. They are worried about it. And I am really worried about that in India. If India has to become more innovative, have to more, have more creative young children, I think we should do more about it and we have to ensure that we don't destroy creativity during the school and college, which we are doing very successfully. Of course, even the best of our institutions give degrees, they give ranks and medals, but the creativity is gone. They are very good, they know too much information. In fact, somebody mentioned information given in the classroom. Information is the last thing a good teacher gives. I think that is the books can give you that. There's a good teacher gives you something more than what is in the book. I think in education, therefore, creativity should be the most important thing we should encourage. The future of India depends on that. Not on the number of BTECs, MDBS we are going to produce, the number of creative people we are creating. There's only a few creative individuals in India that will take India forward. And we need them badly. Don't forget, Newton in the 17th century changed physics. One man, 17th century, how did you do that? Michael Faraday, in the 19th century, did more research in his life than any other human being ever will ever do again. No scientist ever in the history of science will beat the record of Michael Faraday. Because the number of things he did in 19th century with only three years of schooling. He didn't go to college, he didn't go to high school, he only went to three years of primary school. How did he do that? How did he do the loss of electrolysis when no electron was known? How did he discover electricity? How did he discover benzene? In fact, Lord Rutherford said, if only Michael Faraday lived in the 20th century, he would have got at least six or seven Nobel Prizes. And it's true, I have counted five Nobel Prizes guaranteed if you were in the 20th century. Unfortunately, he was in the 19th century. How did he do that? Is it because he went to college? Is it because we all taught him, gave him the IT, mobile phone and all? <laughs> there was no research grant, no Department of Science and Technology and MHRT to give him grants. There were no grants. That's the thing. Please remember that. Our own example. 
In 19th century in India, in the year 1895, our India's first modern scientist was born. That was J.C. Bose. J.C. Bose in the year 1895, well, for those who do not know, he went to England to study, get a degree in science. He actually wanted a degree in medicine. They found he was physically not fit enough to become a doctor. So he left that and went for physics. Got a BA, but unfortunately with a second class in Cambridge University. Came back, taught teaching physics in Calcutta. Of course, he had very famous students at the time. After three, four years of teaching, he said, why am I teaching? Why don't I do some research? Within one year, he set up an experiment. How did he do that? Even today, I asked my student, why don't you set up that experiment of J.C. Bose now? Very difficult. How did he set up that experiment in Calcutta, discover telegraphy for the first time in the world? He actually studied the properties of microwaves, how they go through matter, how they can be used for communication, and even did a public experiment in Calcutta, how microwaves work. A millimeter waves, probably. It doesn't matter. But unfortunately, that work was used by Marconi. Marconi ended up with a Nobel Prize. They ignored, because we were a colony, we couldn't even fight anybody those days. Uh, he should have shared the Nobel Prize with him. Now it's very clear now. And there are many things written about that, about J.C. Bose, even in uh, uh, Royal Society, uh, uh, to which I belong for the last 30 and odd years. Uh, we have written a beautiful document how J.C. Bose's discovery, unfortunately, didn't get the recognition. How did he do that in 1895? 19th century, colonial India, 1897, the electron was discovered. I hope you all know that. If you don't know, let me know. You better remember. Discovery of electron is a very major thing in science. In 1897, before a direct was discovered, here is a man in India, a little Bengali gentleman, doing this great experiment. How did we do that? Actually, that is what we need. That is what we need in India. Because there are foreign examples, many. Ramanujan, our own example, how another man who went, never went to college became one of the world's greatest mathematicians. Why is it we are not producing them in India? Why is it we don't have those guys who are excited about doing science, engineering, whatever the subject be? Our colleges and universities, IITs, Indian of Science, should be Nobody encouraging that. Cont Nobody controls the creative mind. We need those young boys and girls. And that is the purpose of the education thing, Richard thing we are talking about today. If you don't produce them, the rest of it you produce, you can burn it. I don't care. I want a few great geniuses coming out of the soil of this mother country, of mother client here. Yeah. I think that is the purpose. We need those nuts. Please look for them. I am looking for nuts all the time. Nutty boys and girls. In fact, when I was a young professor at Cambridge University in Oxford, they always used to say, the real essence of Oxford, the real whatever creative thing Oxford does, is done by those nutty fellows of the colleges. They used to say, there is some truth in that. There is some truth in that. They are, they are idiosyncrasies. They, are, they don't behave normally. They are excited about something. Catch them young. Well, I should close. We should find a way of hurrying slowly. How to hurry slowly is a very difficult thing. You must hurry to do things, but slowly. That is a contradiction. Of course, the world is full of uh, such contradiction. They say giant prawn. Prawn means small thing. Right? How can you have a giant prawn? Right? Like that. So you must hurry slowly in India. And there's too much hurry in India, nothing happens. A lot of mess to do. A lot of organizations are created without any meaning. They have to say what they are going to do. And I myself am hoping, well, I won't be around in 20 years. I will probably not be alive. Uh, 20, 25 years is a long time. But one thing is, my only hope and prayer is this country will have extraordinary men and women coming out of our education system who will not only revolutionize India and mobilize India's t uh, talent and give it a direction, but will contribute to the entire global science and global knowledge. We will be leaders in the world in the area of knowledge. Thank you.